everyone, and welcome to the first webinar on the Women, Peace, and Security Forum, a groundbreaking initiative by the Jack Gordon Institute at Florida International University. I am Dewey Turner, and it's my privilege to host this series of webinars. The Women, Peace, and Security Forum is a platform where practitioners and academics come together to foster policies and education to advance women, peace, and security. We are committed to creating a dynamic information hub accessible to everyone, offering foundational and also advanced knowledge of women, peace, and security. We aim to close the gap between theory and practice through research excellence, evidence-based analysis, cross-sector collaboration, and professional education. We are the go-to collaborative hub for WPS. And we can say that because we're bringing together the best of the best in our field. So for this very first foundational webinar, I am honored to welcome Dr. Joan Johnson Fries, a leading expert in WPS. She's an author. She literally wrote the book on women, peace and security, a senior fellow at the Women International Security, at the Women in International Security, Professor Emeritus at the US Naval College, War College, and Associate Faculty at Harvard Extension School with extensive experience across defense, security, and space, including China's space program, Dr. Johnson Fries has made significant contributions to understanding complex global issues. So today she will share with us a primer on women, peace, and security to create the foundation and inform our future discussions. Without further ado, Dr. Johnson Fries, welcome to the Gordon's Institute WPS Forum at the Florida International University. Thank you very much, Dewey. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to you. Thank you to uh, the Gordon Institute at FIU. And this initiative is fantastic. This, this bridge between academics and practitioners, beginning with foundational knowledge, is much needed. So I, I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to uh, bring up some slides. You'll bear with me. to walk through uh, some, again, foundational information on women, peace, and security. If I'm doing this presentation or a similar presentation in person, I always start by asking the audience, how many people in the room feel they have a working knowledge of the women, peace, and security framework? And it doesn't matter where I am or who I'm talking to, whether it's 40 people, in Ethiopia or Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, or 400 people at a defense forum, I have never had more than 10% of the audience say that they are familiar with women, peace, and security, which is notable uh, in that it has been uh, in effect through the through the UN Security Council since 2000 and has been law of the land in the United States. Implementation has been law of the land since 2017, so here we are seven years later, and uh, even within the organizations charged with the implementation, there isn't a lot of knowledge. So I am very happy to, to give this presentation and just walk through some of the basics. What I would like to do with you is walk through what women, peace, and security is not. And I start with that because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, misinformation, and just generally, um, lack of knowledge about what it is and misperceptions, and then talk about what it is, and then go to what I consider the money shot, why it's important to national security, why it is different, and why we need to pay attention to it uh, at all levels and within all forums, and then talk about some of the challenges to implementation, which I can summarize um, right now as being a big gap between rhetorical support and actual implementation, including as evidence through budget. So with that, what it is not, Women, Peace and Security is not a social justice program. There are certainly elements of social justice within it, significant elements of Women, Peace, uh, peace and Security within social justice. But the goals of social justice, which is, as its name states, uh, justice for all people, is different than the goals of women, peace, and security, which are gender equality being an enhancing factor for national and international security, striving for 
uh, strengthening national and international security. Social justice has been called the, the, uh, the premier, or uh, gender equality has been called the premier social justice issue for this decade. And I, I don't disagree with that, but that is different from the goals of women, peace, and security. Women, peace, and security is also not a diversity, equity, and inclusion program. There are, again, elements of each of those within women, peace, and security, but the goals are different. DEI programs, as they are commonly known, are run through human resources offices. Women, peace, and security should be run through operations. Diversity, you will see, is, is one of the pillars, participation, more participation from women, but not for the sake of diversity. Um, some people view women, peace, and security as an add women and stir program. Just add women and everything will be fine. That is not what it is. It, it requires diversity, but that's not enough. Equity, and of course, there's many different kind of views or, or versions of equity, certainly plays in. And inclusion plays in. And I'm going to define that a little bit more uh, as we talk. All of those are important, but they are different in their goals from women, peace, and security. Women, peace, and security, because of its name, is often assumed to be about women. And because it's assumed to be about women, it is often dismissed as a security issue. Um, I often talk about in my classes that there is no such thing as women's issues. There are issues which are more or less relevant to women, but to say something is a woman's issue immediately takes it out of the security realm and puts it somewhere else. And that dates back to the tradition of uh, gender, gender stereotyping of spindle and spear, where men are protectors and providers and women are caregivers within the home. And as long as you, as long as that gender stereotyping is adhered to, women, peace and security sometimes finds, uh, finds it difficult to gain traction uh, within a broader audience. So it's not just about women, and it's also important to note that there is no such thing as women's views. What is the women's view of security? Well, women are not part of a Borg. We are all very different in the term intersectionality, which was coined by an American lawyer, um, Crenshaw, her name is Crenshaw, her last name is Crenshaw, and defines it as women from different backgrounds have different advantages, but also different vulnerabilities. We all know that women are paid less uh, than men for equal work in many instances. But we also know that white women make more than women of color, make more than Latina women in some professions. So the idea of it's not just about women and it's not just about one type of woman or one category of women comes into play. It's about how gendered policies affect men, women, boys, and girls. Policies and programs that are implemented with good intent, often good intent for all, will affect individuals differently. Uh, we know that conflicts affect men and women differently. Men are more often than not, though this is changing, the ones who go to war as warriors. But we also know that with uh, conflict, as we've been experiencing it over the past 30 years, women, children, and children are just as likely to die or be, be injured um, as part of a conflict as the warriors themselves. In fact, in some cases, it's even higher. So it's not just about women. It also takes into consideration what we call kind of, again, these gender stereotypes. And it's important that we differentiate sex and gender. Sex is primarily defined by physiology and biology. Although even in those fields, there has been increasingly uh, difficult difficulty within the medical field in just differentiating in a binary way, but it is physiological. 
gender is about roles, expected roles. And if individuals don't adhere to roles expected of them, there can be negative consequences. So recently, of recent years, um, more and more of the occupations traditionally where men work, things that required physical strength, physical labor, things like mining are going away. And we find we have large numbers of unemployed men. We also know that there is an increase in jobs available in care fields, what are known as care fields like nursing. Yet there's a reluctance of men to get into the nursing field because of gender stereotyping and um, expectations of who plays what role in society. So women, peace and security, and I refer to it as a framework rather than an agenda, because I've had people tell me that agenda carries with it sometimes a nefarious or um, sneaky connotation to it. It is a framework which recognizes these differences and then seeks to abate them towards stronger national and international security. So what is it? Uh, the Women, Peace and Security Framework dates back to United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which was passed in the year 2000. It acknowledges gender equality as a matter of security. Now, but many times in the past when I've said that, people push back and say, well, Joan, that's just your, your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. Women, Peace and Security is an evidence-based framework acknowledging gender equality as a matter of national security. Um, a woman named Valerie Hudson at Texas A&M and her uh, multidisciplinary colleagues have a book called The First Political Order where they present the evidence, uh, multi-decade uh, evidence, longitudinal evidence, where they find that if your nation scores high on gender inequality, more than twice as likely to be a fragile state, more than three and a half times as likely of having a government that is autocratic, less effective and more corrupt, and more than one and a half times the chance of that country being violent and unstable. Um, this slide is often the ones that convince skeptics or just individuals who didn't realize uh, the, the importance of gender equality to national security. So it's an evidence-based framework trying to alleviate the negative aspects of security, fragility, autocratic governments, a corruption, violence, instability that weigh on national and international stability. Indiv individuals like a woman named Mary Caprioli, and again, Valerie Hudson, and others have been working for decades looking at evidence which has shown that in countries which is high in gendered social violence, and there's a number of categories which fit into that, uh, that, that description, everything from child and forced marriage to sexual violence, uh, acid attacks, incest, femicide, all of that, in countries where that is high, you're also going to find that there's violence. Again, violence breeds violence, gender inequality um, results in, in these negative characteristics of security. In uh, one of her books, Valerie Hudson has talked about that, that elements of human security, human security being that which directly relates to individuals rather than states themselves. In countries where elements of human security like healthcare, food distribution, um, pay gaps, all of those things, uh, where those are high, those are canaries, what she refers to as canaries in the coal mine, probably indicating high gender inequality and indicators that they are those countries are likely either facing or involved with violence, some type of conflict. So why do I think this is important? Um, why do I teach these classes? Why do I love giving these kind of informational uh, presentations? Because individuals 
who work in security fields, who are in academic programs like international relations, or actually even broader than that, things like nuclear strategy. I worked for years in space security. We look at all different types of factors, but rarely do we look at, rarely if ever, do we look at the role of gender equality in those different aspects of international relations. Um, in my class last year, I had a, an individual, a man, who is a military intelligence officer. And at the end of class, I said, does anybody have any final comments? And he raised his hand and he said, I do, I'm angry. And I said, well, what are you angry about? He said, I am a, a military intelligence analyst. I've taken every course available to me as an analyst and never has anyone talked to me about gender equality. I feel like I've gone through my career with one eye closed when it comes to looking at uh, available information and evidence. So we need to work gender equality into uh, our considerations of security. So again, what is it? It is a framework to work towards increased gender equality. How? Well, like most programs, be it through the government, through the UN, or even in corporations, uh, you have to have three or four pillars to work from. And uh, UNSDR 1325 isn't any different. It has four pillars. Women's participation, increased women's participation at all levels of decision-making. And that's where part of the uh, DEI comes in. Protection of the rights of women and girls. In sadly, in far too many countries, uh, developed and developing, women uh, are still basically uh, penalty-free objects of, of violence, whether that's through sexual assault, through things like acid throwing, honor killings. Women are often, again, penalty-free targets of, of conflict and violence. Incorporation of gender perspectives into conflict prevention. This is looking forward. How do we how do we incorporate gender perspectives into future planning towards a better future? And ensuring that gender considerations are integrated into relief and recovery efforts. When disaster strikes, a, a, a country, a community is thrown into chaos, and chaos hits basically women and children first and hardest. So when you're trying to recover from that, there's an opportunity to not only um, rebuild, but to rebuild better, to understand the importance of gender equality and to rebuild in different and improved ways. So I offer this graphic to show that participation, this idea of women, including women more often, touches all of the pillars. It is not a standalone DEI. It is a, 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 a prerequisite for uh, the other pillars or a, a, a necessary inclusion for all of the others. But when people ask me, well, what is women, peace and security? I usually don't have however much time we've taken so far, 15 minutes to explain. I usually have about three minutes. So I, I basically tell people, Fundamentally, women, peace, and security is about two things. First is inclusive diversity. Um, not just diversity, but inclusive diversity. Women don't just need a seat at the table. They need a voice at the table that will be encouraged and accepted. The first picture on this slide is from the peace talks with the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. In 21 of the 23 talks, there were no women present. In the two where women were present, the Taliban had already checked out knowing that the United States was going to leave and they just had to wait us out. So including women and having them be active participants. The second is from a very well-known and very well-respected security conference a few years ago. If you take a look, it's, it's self-explanatory. This is a panel on security solutions, women contrib contributions. What's wrong with that picture? Well, I think it's obvious what's wrong. There's no women. 
I would think on that topic, you would want to have women included. It's this idea that sometimes it's, it's, it's assumed that issues which directly relate to women, women don't need to be included. And that is wrong. The second part is gendered perspectives. More women die in car accidents than men. And it's not because we are worse drivers. It is because the crash dummies around which safety standards are based have traditionally been built around crash dummies model after men's physique. So they don't work as well for, for women. A crash dummy that is six feet tall and 190 pounds, the standards set for that physique are not gonna work for a five foot 100 pound woman. Interestingly, um, a, a female crash dummy was developed in Sweden in 2022. Whether or not it will become uh, actively used, we'll have to wait and see. The other is, again, the example I already gave you about getting more men into women's, uh, traditionally women's professions and breaking the idea of gender stereotyping. The bottom uh, photo is uh, exemplifying food health, food security. The Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome has, has basically said, if we took the amount of food aid that is given, not looking to increase it, just the food aid that is given and distributed it differently, distributed to the workers rather than the landowners, because in many countries, it is more women than men that work the land, but it's always, almost always the men who own the land. And it's been found in far too many cases when the men landowners receive the food aid, they simply sell it on the black market, pocket the profit, and don't put it back into the land. So FAO says if food distribution were differently done, we could have 100 to 150 million less hungry people. So gender equality and the principles of women, peace and security are, are literally ones that matter in terms of life and death. Well, then I get the question, well, what do women add to security decision-making? What is all this participation going to do for us? Well, this is a, a graph that we used for many years at the Naval War College when we were talking about strategy. It's from a, um, an article written by two of my colleagues, Derek Revron and Jim Cook, from an article in Joint Force Quarterly. And it talks about how to develop effective strategy. And it's the basic ends means way diagram. But the two elements of effective strategy that have to be considered that come from the outside are resource constraints, first of all. Um, there's an adage, only poets create strategy without a budget. So you need to work within your budget. And then the second is you have to have as, as complete a picture of the environment as possible. When the United States uh, went into Iraq, um, without fully understanding the Sunni-Shia conflict, we were missing a big element of the security environment that was a handicap for, for quite a while. Going into a security environment requires talking to everyone. We found that out certainly in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, women, part of cultural support teams, were... Um, were trained as, as shooters and trained as uh, in their own fields to go out with the special forces teams in kick the door down operations and talk to the women because the men couldn't talk to the local women because of religious dictates. Uh, what they found in many instances, it, the, the, the women were very happy to talk to them. Many of the women in Afghanistan really didn't like their husbands because they were very often brutalized by them. And the women were able to gather information otherwise unavailable to the forces towards increasing mission effectiveness. Additionally, we know that um, women and men have different propensities towards problem solving. Not always the case, but propensities. 
Of the five different types, competing, collaborating, comprising, accommodating, and avoiding, it probably won't surprise you that men tend to compete or avoid, whereas women tend to collaborate, compromise, and accommodate. By adding diversity, by adding women to a security decision-making progress, you simply increase your options of problem solving. Not saying one is better than the other, they are appropriate in different situations, but it adds opportunity. We also know that men and women communicate differently. Um, men communicate to pass along information, women communicate to make relationships. Men and women listen differently. Women listen for emotion. I always give the example of my significant other. If he asks me, are you okay? And I say, I'm fine. He hears literally that I'm fine, even though the tone of my voice has not said that. So it's again, just additive skills, additive options um, that, that open the aperture of decision-making that is available. George Washington, one of the American founding fathers, his uh, one of the leadership traits that he most admired and most spoke about was prudence. Prudence is being goal-focused and holding ego in check. And women are considered to be more prudent than men. That doesn't mean that women are hesitant it means they are goal focused and can keep ego in check because men too tend to compete. So this uh, quote from Christine Lagarde, managing director of the IMF, it had been Lehman sisters rather than Lehman brothers, the world might look a lot different today, is speaking to the idea of prudence, less risk taking, um, often prompted by ego. So what do we know? What, what do we know about adding women? Well, we know when women are included in peace processes, there is a 20% increase in the probability that the agreement will last at least two years and a 35% increase in the probability of the agreement lasting at least 15 years because more information is considered, more problem solving types, more, more goal orientation, we know there is a positive effect. And yet, women are included in negotiations less than 10% of the time. So we know it's effective. We know the relationship. We know the evidence about uh, gender equality and, and stability and avoiding corruption, but we're not there. The uh, Women, Peace, and Security Framework is implemented on a national basis. And this graph shows uh, the number of countries who have what are called national action plans for WPS implementation. It, it, the numbers are excellent. 107 countries have national action plans. Unfortunately, many of them uh, have expired and simply not renewed. Many of them have been largely symbolic, and that is evidenced by the um, the fact that less than 10% of those countries with national action plans have supporting budgets. So there's lots of rhetorical support for women, peace, and security. There is less actual support um, to move it into implementation. Many of the national action plans will have either an external or an internal focus. The United States, for example, for example, the national action plan is mostly for implementing it abroad. We certainly advocate for gender equality, but the action items are all exterior. In many countries that have uh, recently come out of internal conflict, they are internally focused. It is essential that there be both. Uh, for the United States, we can't have a, a women, peace and security implementation plan, which basically says, do as we say, not as we do. And quite frankly, the sexual assault rates, including in professions like the military, are still such that gender equality has a long way to go. 
Um, that in addition to other considerations of inclusion in places like boardrooms, um, just general food security uh, along different economic lines, there's a lot we need to do internally in order to um, have credibility in, in external actions. This is just an example of what can happen or has happened in the United States between 2000 and now. In 2000, again, uh, UNSCR 1325 was passed. There have been nine subsequent uh, resolutions to kind of fill in the, the gaps and plug up some holes. That was followed by our first national action plan in 2011, updated in 2016. The United States was number 50 out of now 107 uh, countries with a national action plan. So we were not in the forefront. And it probably isn't surprising that it was many of the Scandinavian uh, European countries that were at the forefront of developing national action plans. The national strategy for implementation named four organizations, Department of State, Defense, USAID, and Department of Homeland Security as the, the key implementers. And again, it begins with seek and support preparation and participation of women across the board in decision-making, uh, promote the protection of women and girls' human rights. You would think that's already the case, but sadly it's not. And then it goes to international programs and partner nations. But again, um, if you believe that you can tell what's important to an individual or an organization through their budget, Women, Peace and Security has had about $8 million uh, allotted to it through in, in the Defense Department. That's out of a more than $1.3 trillion budget. So um, not a lot of commitment is shown at least through budget. We then have a strategic framework and implementation plan within agencies. This one happens to be DOD. There was a first report back to Congress on what's been done in 2022 and an updated national action plan in 2023, which in my opinion, uh, puts more pressure towards uh, implementation at the department level. Personally, I think until Congress mandates increased budgets for implementation, it's going to be uh, slow going. This is a graph explaining how, how convoluted, complex implementation can become. All well-intended, but when you have so many things to accomplish, um, there is a tendency, not just in the United States by any means, to move towards box checking. Um, what did you do? What can we do as an organization that has to account back to somebody, in, in the case of the United States Congress, to show that we've done something. Well, we've had a conference. Um, we have implemented a program to start keeping data on women's involvement in different programs, but we need to move beyond that. So I talked about diversity and I mentioned that inclusion is really key. Um, and it's important to recognize that this is where we go beyond participation and, and integration. We've certainly moved beyond exclusion for women in most fields. And in some cases that was relatively recently, if you look at uh, women being allowed in uh, combat, ground combat, the exclusion uh, previously applied only to ground combat, and that's now gone. Segregation. But I would argue where we are right now with participation is integration. That is, women are allowed into professions, but they're not really given the support, um, encouragement of all types to really be part of the team. There is a great Pixar eight minute video, which I encourage you to take a look at called Pearl, that really explains uh, inclusion. And when you don't have inclusion of the type that this little video argues for and that I'm talking about here, you add women, but you don't get the benefits of their, of their involvement. Um, many times when women feel they are not really included, they will just keep quiet. 
um, if they're, especially if they're climbing a, a, an advancement ladder or fear for their careers for speaking out, you don't get the benefits that partic participation should, should render. So why exclusion? Um, a lot of different reasons. There are assumptions made. The difference between fact and belief. Women aren't good at math. Women can't be firefighters because they can't carry body weight. Well, not all women can, but some some can. Um, so we there's a lot of assumptions. There's also something called blind fish. Blind fish basically says, well, two fish swimming in a goldfish bowl, and one fish says to the other, how do you like the water? And the other goldfish says, what's water? It's being blind to your environment. If you've never experienced bias, discrimination, prejudice, you may not recognize it around you, which is why in many organizations, if you ask the men in the organization, um, is this a gender equal organization? They'll all say yes. And you ask the women, you might not get the same answer. But again, I wanted to point out whether it's Masa Amini who was murdered in Iran for improperly wearing her hijab, or it's Malala in Pakistan shot in the head at age 15 for advocating girls' uh, educational rights, a British parliamentarian, Joe Cox, stabbed by a white nationalist, or the two women who were the first to pass the Army Rangers team in 2015, who initially their identities had to be hidden because of death threats to them. Sometimes inclusion, gender equality and inclusion can be threatening to power structures, power structures that are benefiting from the current power structure. So why does it matter to national security? Well, new technologies and capabilities, we hear a lot about them. Uh, this woman, Joyce Bulawini, Bulawini uh, was an uh, artificial intelligence researcher at MIT and realized that AI couldn't recognize her face. And when she looked into it, it was because most AI developers were white men who basically the spectrum of what kind of face AI could recognize was very narrow. Well, if you're developing a new technology you want it to be as inclusive as possible, or it really will not be uh, as, as effective and useful to you as you need it to be. Workforce issues. Uh, this article was written by a former student of mine, an Air Force cyber warrior, who pointed out that although cyber is a field that is lacking in, in workforce, uh, enough workforce to fill all the, uh, the potential, all the uh, available jobs, that in the Air Force, there's two tracks, one administrative and one warriors. Where are all the women tracked? Into administration. And she argues that you need to include them in the warrior to again, offer all those things that we've talked about and that you need to think about the culture that you wanna to generate to keep them there. Without women, peace and security, without getting the whole picture of the security environment, very often in dealing with conflicts, we only deal with the effects, the, the guns firing. We don't look at the core problems, the causes, and those causes can very often be traced back to inequality, bias, things affecting food, water, land, employment, housing, religious freedom, all of those things. So having a full picture of the environment allows you to address issues which keep peace treaties in effect longer. In the United States right now, we hear a lot about integrated deterrence, the idea that we need to, to look at a bigger uh, picture. Well, without including the Women, Peace and Security framework, you're not getting a lot of those benefits that you could get from deterrence because deterrence of all types requires full knowledge of whoever or whatever you're trying to deter. Um, we hear about Boko Haram brides, young girls being kidnapped. They are being kidnapped as a recruitment uh, tool for, for terrorist organizations like Boko Haram. 
in many countries, men are not considered men until they are married with children. And in many countries, if they can't afford to pay what's called a bride price to get married, they will never have that status as a real man. Um, so organizations, and it happened with the Taliban, it's happened with Boko Haram, um, will kidnap women and offer them as recruitment tools. That's a national security issue. In China, they are currently worried because their, their sex ratio, the ratio of women to men, was skewed by their one child policy and a policy which encouraged women to be educated to the extent that there's now 100 women for every 107 men, which means in China, and it's also true in India and a couple other countries, there are millions of men that will never be married. And unmarried men are considered bigger security risks than those that are uh, tethered to society. So what do women add to security decision-making? In both the civilian and military sectors, they increase organizational effectiveness in ways including workforce, efficiency, innovativeness, capabilities, problem solving, communication, and more. Globally, it offers increased potential for security and stability. Challenges, funding, as I said, until, uh, until implementation plans are adequately funded, and this is a matter in the United States for Congress, uh, there will be more rhetoric than action. So far, implementation has relied on leadership, uh, but that means that those in the United States, in the military, it's gender advisors, and Dewey Turner is one, uh, gender advisors and gender focal points have to convince leaders of the relevance of women, peace, and security, and they might leaders might accept it, but things can change in a heartbeat. So those leaders have to have a plan, commitment, and accountability for implementation. What I believe is the better option is ground up knowledge. Ground up, grow it, put it into education systems in both the uh, civil and governmental programs. It also requires women working together. Sadly, as Dewey held up the, the book that I wrote, Women Versus Women, The Case for Cooperation, uh, they, women are, are traditionally, have traditionally been taught to compete, most often for a husband as a protector provider. But now we're competing with other women for jobs and for other things as well. Women have to learn to work together. That is the only way we are going to get a voice at the table. And in the national action plans, we need to have internal and external commitment, uh, inclusion of, of women across the board. And uh, not only in other countries, but in our own countries as well. So what do we know? This is my concluding slide here. What do we know? We know that gender equality is linked to national security and militarism and violence or nonviolence. We know that violence breeds violence. If there, is gen if there is gendered violence in the home, which is called the first political order, it will, it will spill over and become the de facto decision-making um, tool across the board. So violence breeds violence. We know that inclusion of women in security decision-making yields long-lasting positive outcomes. It's evidence-based. And we know that inclusion is still the exception rather than the rule in many instances. The um, bumper sticker for my book, for my courses, for my talks is always, you can't implement what you don't know about. And I started by saying how few people know and understand the basic principles of women, peace and security. And opportunities to speak to audiences such as I'm having today I hope will increase the number of those aware, having a basic awareness and want to know more. And I know this series is going to offer you more information and that Dewey's going to talk about that so that we know what Women, Peace and Security is and we can implement it. But this first step, and thank you for joining me to take it, is to understand the basics of Women, Peace and Security.
So thank you very much, Dewey. That's it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson Fries, for sharing so much knowledge with us. Uh, I have so much love and respect for you. And I think even though I've been working in the field of women, peace and security for years now, I probably can watch this webinar over and over and learn something new. I took so many notes and it never fails whenever I hear you speak or teach that I learn something new. And I really hope that with this foundational primer, we can raise the awareness and really take some of those misconceptions and, and elevate the, the knowledge of women, peace and security. I have no doubt that this will be a, a evergreen webinar that everyone can, can watch to learn the foundations of women, peace and security. So, so much, thank you so much again. Thank you for the opportunity. And I know you're going to take this forward in a fantastic way. We all will We're all together as a teamwork. So now I, I would like to transition to some questions based on your insights, both as a scholar and an academic. Uh, we talked a lot, a lot about the trajectory of the history of women, peace and security, uh, where we are, a little bit about the future, but I really would like to dive in a little bit more. I love what you said, you know, we go from talking to action. And I think a lot of the Women, Peace and Security Forum, that's the, the, the vision. How do we go from theory to action? So based on your work, uh, I'm wondering what positive changes and advancements do you foresee for women, peace and security? And could you share with us maybe some of the most promising initiatives or developments that you believe will shape the future of women, peace and security and, and create change? Well, I think, um, I think we are moving into what I refer to as phase two. We're moving beyond the box checking. Um, where people didn't know what they were doing. They had to say they were doing something. And so there was a lot of box checking. And I say that um, based on the new national action plan, I think that put pressure on the departments to really show effective implementation. I say that based on as well, um, efforts both within the civilian and the governmental sectors to include knowledge about women, peace, and security. That, that idea, you can't implement what you don't know about. Uh, there are more and more academic programs. Harvard is going to have a micro certificate available. There are other programs that are working on women, peace, and security. So I think that that first step is, is becoming a reality. Um, again, I'd really like to see the budget go up, but that's up to Congress. The other thing is I think within the military, um, the defense sectors generally, um, there's a recognition and I've seen a lot of success with security cooperation programs, the kind that you've worked on. I know uh, Dewey and I do a program together where we work with a, a number of foreign military officers and they always tell us how happy they are that we talk about this because it allows them to go back and talk about it. Uh, it might not be well received if they were to bring it up initially, but because we talk about it, they can. So I think these security cooperation programs have a the potential for really making an impact in other countries. Thank you. And, and we have worked together on the security and defense realm. But I know that you also have extensive experience in other areas, uh, including a space which is fascinating. So I'm wondering, when we look at the broader space of women, peace, and security, um, why is it critical to bring WPS beyond, or not just with security and defense, but in other areas such as science and education, international relations, sustainability, really bring it to the forefront um, of, of advancing uh, society and, and ways of thinking mindsets. As you brought up, I worked for many years in space security. The kind of long arc of my academic career was in space security. Um, I wrote books on it. I testified before Congress. And uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I started working in women, peace and security, I was ready to make that change because I had said everything I wanted to say about space security, actually I had said it more than once, and nobody wanted to listen. They, the, the, well, not that they should always listen to me, 
But in the space security, the only question that was being asked was how to win a space war. Why weren't we talking about how to avoid a space war? How to end a space war? What role does diplomacy pay? But all of those things were considered too feminine. Um, interestingly, I am, I've been working with a woman, uh, two different women, one in space security and one in nuclear strategy. Those fields are beginning to understand that the principles of women, peace, and security open the aperture of potential uh, policy avenues. So I think, again, whether it is food security, health, nuclear strategy, these principles of inclusion, the things that women add, always apply. Thank you. And I think that's a great transition as you're talking about other women in some really cutting edge fields. And you did mention and talked about the competition. And I have your book here, which I love. It was so much needed. I feel that it spoke directly to be the women versus women, a case for a corporation highly recommend to everybody, men and women. Uh, and, and, and there is in your book, you highlight the significance of working together, uh, supporting one another. So in your perspective, how can we foster this collaboration? Because we know that the competition exists, right? But how can we foster collaborating women, women with women, but also with different stakeholders, institutional and private governments, NGOs, like really bringing everybody together uh, to collaborate and advance the women, peace and security agenda more effectively? For women, um, I think, sadly, we have, even in the United States, seen a rollback in uh, women's rights. And I think women are recognizing that, that if we don't stand together, we're going to hang separately, as the adage goes. That, I mean, we've certainly seen that in certain policy areas, that as women's rights are taken away and there's a recognition that women will work together. A woman named uh, Michaela McKenzie wrote a book on women athletes and how they were able to achieve all of their goals in terms of power, money, and respect. I think that's the name of her book. Um, because everybody was disadvantaged. Everybody was being discriminated against. But that's not the case in most countries. Some women do well, other women do not so well. And so there's not this impetus to everybody band together. But as women's rights are being rolled back, um, I think there is increasingly a recognition that we need to, to stand together, at least in some fields. Unfortunately, I don't think it's true in Congress, but among the populace, I think we're seeing it more. In terms of other uh, allies, men, there are many men who have been great allies to the Women, Peace and Security Framework. And very often, um, sadly, as you and I both know, sometimes what a man says is taken more seriously than what a woman says. And when a man says, listen up, this is important, it will work. So allyship, and I mean real allyship, there is such a thing as performative allyship, which means you just get up and say, we're in favor of it and then never mention it again. Um, comes when individuals recognize the benefits. Uh, and you can't blame them for that. If an organization seems to be working well, they have to be shown how it could work even better before they're willing to move there. And for me, it's been showing the evidence slide, showing the slide of what the data shows. And um, I think the more we can get the data out and data, anybody who's watching this, if they're in a position to collect data, I encourage you to, to collect as much gender differentiated data as possible, because that's where we get the evidence that can be convincing. Thank you so much. Very insightful. And I love this idea of, of um, uh, when we work with allies, right? What did you say? Ally, ally, ally allyship. Allyship. I love it. I'm going to add that to my vocab, allyship. Yes. It's not only about women, it's inclusive of men and women and beyond and working together. So thank you for, for that insight. And that will bring us to my last question. It's an important question because this is our first webinar, January 2024. And January is the National Human Trafficking Prevention Month. 
So we have a whole pillar on protection. So how do you see uh, women, peace, and security in intersecting with or contributing to the prevention of human trafficking? Well, the, the protection pillar of women, peace, and security certainly encompasses this whole idea of, of trafficking. And um, although men are certainly uh, trafficked, it is most often women and children who are trafficked for um, sex exploitation. Uh, that is not the only reason for trafficking, but it is the primary one. And I think that gets to this the heart of recognizing gender equality um, as a fundamental human right, as a fundamental premise for the security of, of, of communities and na nations as well. So I think the, the protection principle, moving beyond women being penalty-free targets, um, that's accountability. And again, that goes back to leadership. And I think uh, so often trafficking becomes a legal uh, a structural uh, consideration. You know, we need more laws and we certainly do, but gender equality is hampered by both structural barriers and cultural barriers. And I think we've done a lot of work on the trafficking structural barriers, but we need to do a lot more on the cultural. Women are not property. Women are not objects. Women are not penalty-free targets. Thank you so much. And I think it's important to highlight going full circle what you mentioned earlier that, you know, often we see women, peace and security as just for women. Uh, we are looking at gender perspectives. So this entire idea of prevention of human trafficking is also to understand that there are victims of human trafficking. They are not women. There are men and, and boys and girls. So really looking at different perspectives where we can uh, help um, prevent and, and address this, this important problem. Well, I am so thankful for you for being our first guest. We're, we're, we're cutting the ribbon in, in the highest levels. I, I truly value your contributions and, and everything that you do for women, peace and security. I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me. Thank you. And as we conclude our first uh, our first episode, I want to recap that here at the Women, Peace and Security Forum, we are committed to advancing knowledge and action through collaboration, research and education. I encourage all of you to engage in our resources in our webpage and participate in future webinars. Join the conversation on our social media, hashtag FIUWPS. Next month, our guest is uh, an author and uh, uh, a very um, recognized author, Deborah Botello. She wrote Narcos. And I invite you to engage in our conversation about the role of women in narco trafficking. That's next month. So please stay tuned and check our show notes for information about today's episode, our webpage, and also information about Dr. Johnson Fries, as you have watched today, an amazing expert. And please follow her work. Um, like me, you will likely just keep learning and learning and learning. I want to close with a huge shout out to the Jet Gordon Institute's team, particularly Brian, Bruce, Robbie, Alexis, and Caesar. Things like this, initiatives like this don't happen by itself. It takes a team, and that's the team that really is coming together to, to, to bring this initiative forward. So thank you for your support and trust. And thanks to you for watching. Let's just stay engaged. Thank you so much. Bye.